Greetings and welcome to the second half of part 10 in a series of videos on Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. In this session we shall conclude our study of the issues involved in the 360 day versus solar or calendar year controversy. Our biblical search will lead us to a very definite conclusion as to which one is the true and faithful key to the prophecy. Other videos on the subject of the 70 weeks prophecy are at the YouTube channel Gavin Finlay and there are also a number of articles at the website endtimepilgrim.org. As we've seen wrapped up in the seven verses of scripture that we've mentioned previously, someone is presenting us with a riddle. The seven verses all appear to be describing the latter half of the 70th week of Daniel. So we're being drawn into a puzzle. And what is it that this someone is showing us in these seven verses? And can we see it? If we approach the seven verses in faithful Berean or biblical fashion, we discover that when we do our homework, the riddle actually solves itself. The Bible is its own best interpreter. And then wonder of wonders, the entire 70 weeks prophecy opens up to us. The clincher proving that God has delivered the 77s of years to us in units of 360 day biblical years is right there in front of us with those two verses 6 and 14 of Revelation chapter 12. Both of them are describing the flight of the woman God's elect in the latter days. This wonderful image of the vision John saw is by Pat Marvanko Smith. Her gallery is at revelationillustrated.com. In Revelation 12 we see that at the close of the age the covenant people of God are presented as the woman in travail. Being threatened by the dragon she flies off to her place, a place of confinement where at the end of her exile she will deliver the man-child. This image is by Pat Marvenko Smith. The unrefined covenant people on their way to becoming the ultimate refined remnant Israel are also presented in scripture as Jacob. In Micah 2, 12 to 13, the prophet Micah hears God declare that he will gather all of Jacob as the sheep of the fold, the sheep of Bozrah, which is in Edom. This would certainly be the time of Jacob's trouble. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus referred to his people as they came into the latter days as the elect, and this is in Matthew 24. The Apostle Paul spoke of the commonwealth of Israel in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. So the Holy Spirit in Holy Scripture, chooses to use different handles for God's covenant people in order to give us different perspectives on the unfolding story. In Revelation 12:6, the time of the flight and exile of the woman is given to us as 1260 days. The matching description of the exile is given to us eight verses later in verse 14 of Revelation 12. We are told in this verse that the exile will last 3.5 years. So 3.5 years equals 1260 days. This is our second Rosetta Stone for biblical time. From this we get the biblical year, it's 360 days. This double reference we see in Revelation 12 is the main clue in our search for biblical or prophetic time. From this discovery we solve the riddle of the seven verses. So here is the key we use to unlock prophetic or biblical time periods. And we can use it to successfully unlock the 70 weeks prophecy. We can also use the 360 day year to lay out the former 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Our key introduces biblical years of 360 days and biblical months of 30 days. This true and genuine key of biblical time lines up all the tumblers, it aligns and unifies all seven verses to open the lock on the latter half of the 70th week of Daniel, the final 3.5 years of this age. Prophetic time is not only confirmed by Holy Scripture, it also comes to us as a divine revelation of beauty and truth in the mathematics and geometry of a holy God. Was this 360 day year and 30 day month the original calendar describing the passages of the earth and the moon at the creation? Was this the clockwork of the solar system when God looked down on his handiwork and said that it was good? And were the orbits of the earth and moon disturbed at the cataclysms that came with the flood? The flood account in Genesis 7 and 8, where five months to the day are given to us as 150 days, points to that possibility. The flood account in Genesis gives us our first Rosetta Stone, as it were, for biblical time. There is nothing difficult, arcane, or obscure here. 150 divided by 5 is 30, so we do the math and then we believe what God is showing us. As we have seen, the 360-day biblical year, together with the 30-day biblical month, bring all seven verses into perfect unity and harmony 
has 1260 days. When we are open to the idea that God is issuing time to us not according to this present natural order here below, but according to the perfection of his throne up above, and having received that, we then proceed on to do the math, everything just falls into place perfectly. So the 360-day biblical or prophetic year is fixed for us by the two time periods given to us for the exile of the woman of Revelation chapter 12. She is given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly away from the face of the dragon. Let's pause for a moment to reflect on this. The heavens were telling this awesome story long before the scriptures were written. The epic climax to this age is seen in the constellations of the stars. The lesser sheepfold is an ancient name for the Little Dipper. The pre-flood patriarchs knew about this end-time drama, and as they looked up into the night sky, they saw the magnificent deliverance by the Breaker, the Messiah, at the climax of the age. The heavens are telling the same awesome end time story in the constellation of Andromeda. Here the woman is chained to a rock on the seashore and threatened by a monster coming up from the sea. The image to the right is by 19th century artist Gustav Dorr, who has done a number of works on biblical themes. Uh, Saints, this is not mythology. God put these signs into the heavens before he laid the foundation of the earth. Adam and Enoch and the early patriarchs talk with God about these stories back in the pre-flood era. Long before the Bible was written, God's wonderful story of redemption and deliverance was pictured in the constellations and written in the names of the stars. But some will ask, is this time of the exile really three and a half years? What about the time times and the dividing of time that we see in Daniel 7.25? In these three times times passages, isn't God merely telling us that the time period is nothing more than three solar years and a portion, an uneven chunk of a solar year? Some will argue that the words dividing of a time we see translated for us in the King James Version for Daniel 7.25 indicates that this is not time times and a half a time at all, but an imprecise three years and a portion of a year. Without looking further into the matter, they jump to the conclusion that all three times times verses in Daniel and in the book of Revelation are similarly vague and imprecise. They will argue that these verses are not speaking of 3.5 years at all, but merely three solar years and a dividing a portion or a a chunk of a solar year. They do this in order to try to make the solar year fit. Is this true? Well, let's take a look. Here is our first scripture, Daniel 7.25, doing the word study on the Hebrew word translated in Daniel 7.25 as dividing of. We see it as the word pelag, Strong's word 6387. This map shows where the earth was divided, with parts of the earth's crust pushed up during the geographical cataclysm that happened in the post-flood days of Peleg. Peleg's name is related to the word Peleg. Peleg was named for the dividing of the earth that was seen in his lifetime. A related word, Peleg, strong 6386, is used to describe the feet on the image of Daniel chapter 2. The feet were divided into partly iron and partly miry clay. The word divide here means a portion or partition. It does not have to mean cut in half or into equal parts, although such a possibility is not precluded. So we can certainly agree that the time times and the dividing of time we see in Daniel 7.25 does not actually stipulate half. We should also know that this prophecy is cryptic. Daniel was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. Apparently this message was intended to be veiled until people worthy, concerned and responsible before God and to his covenant people came along and asked him for more specific information. So as the heavenly message starts to come to the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, we see the phrase dividing of time. And yes, this is certainly imprecise, but remember this was written during the reign of Belshazzar before the fall of Babylon. This was just the first of the three times times verses. Now we come to something interesting. At the end of the book of Daniel in chapter 12, we see that time has moved on and things are changing. Something happened here by another river, and now the prophet Daniel has been given an update to that earlier prophecy he received years before. In Daniel 12.7, we see that the time, times, and the dividing of time prophecy we saw earlier in chapter 7, which related to the end time tribulation of the saints, is now reissued to us in more precise terms as time, times, and a half. Daniel receives the message and records the words spoken to him, but he is absolutely flabbergasted at what he hears. He does not understand it at all. How can the saints see their political and military power shattered and be given into the hand of the beast, and then rise up victoriously to be given the kingdom at the end. Daniel is not given an answer to this conundrum. He is just told, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed up, sealed, until the time of the end. 
But the prophet Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, receives an inspiring message which sheds some further light on this. It is the vision of the valley of dry bones. You can read this in Ezekiel 37. And this is another wonderful image by Gustav Dorr. Daniel is astounded at what he hears. Nevertheless, he gets the update. The time of the great tribulation is time, times, and a half. So to think of the three years and a chunk of a year is certainly an acceptable interpretation for the earlier passage in Daniel 7.25. But as we are now beginning to see, that was not the last word on the matter. It was just the beginning of the message. Here in Daniel 12.7 and later in Revelation 12.14, we get the rest of the story. These two verses, which follow on after Daniel's earlier vision in chapter 7, state the time period for us very precisely as time times and a half a time. In Daniel 12, at the end of the book, we see the word half is used, and it is the Hebrew word chetzi, Strong's 2677. This word does not mean dividing off. The word is faithfully rendered by the King James translators as half. So now we see an exact accounting of the time period the Hebrew word chetzi occurs 125 times in the KJV. 108 of those times the word is translated very specifically as half. Here are some examples. Midnight has long been a time recognized as that discrete point in the middle of the night. And the watchman going all the way back to ancient times knew that midnight was the point precisely halfway through the night watches. In the book of Ruth we read that it was at midnight that Boaz became aware that the maiden Ruth was lying at his feet. And here in that passage from Ruth is the Hebrew word for midnight in its two parts, those being chetzi, meaning half or middle, Strong's 2677, and the Hebrew word layel, meaning night. In Exodus 25, we see the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. The measurements are given to us in minute accuracy, down to half a cubit. We dare not even think that there is anything vague or imprecise about the word half in this passage. It is 0.5 or 50%. This is the very same Hebrew word chetzi, translated as half, we see in the angel's message to Daniel in Daniel 12.7. You'll notice that the word half is very often and very specifically related to blood covenant matters between God and his people. We saw this right back at the beginning when Abraham made covenant with Yahweh God. On that occasion, animals were cut in half right down the middle. So at the end of the book of Daniel, the prophet is told in more specific terms about this coming time of trial. There has been an updating of the earlier message we first saw in Daniel 7.25. And now in Daniel 12, we are seeing that this time of great tribulation leading to the scattering of the power of the holy people is to last time times and a half a time, or 3.5 years. So why has this happened? What has changed between Daniel 7 and Daniel 12? Here is something for us to consider. When we come to the end of the book, Daniel is no longer under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and the Babylonian powers. Daniel receives this new vision some years later, during the third year of Cyrus the Persian. Nearly 150 years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah foretold his birth, his very name, and the tasks that God had predetermined for him to accomplish, saying, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure. And you can read about this in Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, 1. Cyrus had declared amnesty and freed the captives of Judah. He also showed them special favor as they returned home to resettle Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. So it is possible that the principalities and powers over the Persians may have been less inclined to limit the word of God coming down to Israel's agent, the prophet Daniel, as he served under the Persian rulers. Is there another reason to explain why the prophet Daniel has suddenly received this more specific and precise information? And the answer might surprise us because it's right there in the text. Daniel received the information because he asked. He was a man beloved of God. And why? Because he had been accountable and responsible before God for his own sins and for the sins of all his people. His concern was for the covenant people of God. They had been scattered and afflicted before and during his lifetime. Now he was hearing of what would befall them in the latter days. He was concerned, and he wanted to know more about this. The prophet Daniel had been told that God's people would be fully restored and would inherit the kingdom at the end. But he was also told that they would be facing unprecedented trials as they came up to the climax of the age. Daniel was asking for more accurate information concerning those future days. He was asking for this info on our behalf, and he got it. We have a third instance of this time, times prophecy. This time we find it near the end of the Bible, in the visions John saw in the book of Revelation. And our verse is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Here we see the phrase, time, times, and a half a time, and the word half is the Greek word hemesis, Strong's number 
G2255, and it means half. So now we have full and solid confirmation that the time times and a half a time, as well as the earlier time times and a dividing of time in Daniel 7.25, are all referring to the same latter-day time period, a period of precisely 3.5 biblical years running up to the climax of this age. So we can be sure that the 360-day biblical year and the 30-day biblical month are both true and correct for the latter half of the 70th week. This is biblical or prophetic time. The 3.5 years are 3.5 biblical years of 360 days, and the 42 months are 42 biblical months of 30 days. All seven verses are speaking of 1260 days. These words in this message have been and continue to be sealed up to be sure, but only by a straight gate, the way of the cross. The principalities and powers and our own flesh all conspire to prevent us from finishing our pilgrimage and bringing in the end time witness. As we have seen, solving the puzzle is not all that difficult for those with a biblical world view. Those who are wise, devoted to God, with a mindset open to the supernatural sovereignty of God, will understand these things. Those committed to the witness of Messiah will make it a priority to search out, comprehend, receive, and to act on this message. Remember, too, that the Word of God and biblical truth does not come to us by intellectual effort or theological knowledge. Rather, God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit operating in and through the Holy Scriptures. God's Word is thereby revealed to us from His throne up in the third heaven, far above the gyrations and the noise of this present cosmos. As we have seen, this truth concerning biblical time confirms itself by turning the lock to open up the future 70th week of Daniel. So we can now proceed on to use the 360-day biblical year with confidence as our key to unlock the entire 70 weeks prophecy. When we do this for the former 69 sevens of years, that timeline as well falls into place with superb accuracy. So why is this study of the 70 weeks prophecy so important? The answer is simple. So we can have this chart into the future. We need to have it firmly fixed in our minds that there is a future 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years of this age. This is the final sabbatical for this present evil age, and it is up there in our future. It leads right on up to the jubilee year of the millennium of Messiah. And so let us remember our God and his word, and our vital role of witness as we go up on stage or into the arena at the climax of this age. We simply cannot even think of skipping out early or abandoning ship to save our own skins, like the crew tried to do in the shipwreck of the Apostle Paul. We have a job to do, and as with the Apostle Paul, God has given us the lives of all who sail with us. So let us keep our relationship with him as our top priority. And as we go about our business in this world, and as we face our disappointments and our temptations to run away from the faith in our Messiah, let us always keep this in the back of our minds. We are on our way to a wedding feast. It also happens to be a victory feast. For those who have tasted the heavenly food, it's all there. And the wine, well... As we saw at Cana, the best wine is reserved until the last. The highway of holiness leads onwards and upwards towards the gates of glory. Grace and shalom to all the saints.